All right, let's take a look here. Uh, uh, new new topic for discussion here. We got a tweet a few days back, uh, Matt from uh, at Chris M underscore Jones, and and Chris said, "Would love for the two of you to cover some small cap financials. Uh, for example, uh, AX UVE. Full disclosure: UVE was my first stock and now is my largest position. So so the bottom line is here. Chris was hoping we could take a look into some more small cap financial stocks, and you know, Matt, you and I love talking stocks, and when you get to find compelling small cap." Financials, and that's we could probably talk about that for the next four hours, but unfortunately, we're not going to be given that much time. So, uh, we thought we would take an opportunity here to target two companies each uh, in the small cap space that we like and see if we could give Chris a couple of ideas, companies that we like, some things to keep an eye on with them. Um, and we're going to start the discussion here with a company, Matt, you know, Synovus, ticker is SNV. Uh, give us your, your elevator pitch for Synovus. Yeah, well, this is a, a bank that I drive by a lot because it's a southern regional bank. Um, <clears throat> the reason I like this, I like Synovus is one, they're profitable. Two, they're growing very fast. So, on the side of profitability, the uh, return on assets of a little over 1.3, return on equity of 14% are both great numbers. Um, the loan portfolio is growing at a pretty impressive rate, um, about 4.5% a year. And they're making acquisitions on a pretty aggressive basis, and they're actually getting really good deals. Um, I reported earlier over the summer. That Synovus decided to acquire a bank called FCB Financial, a Florida community bank, and they actually wound up getting a discount to the share price. Generally, when you acquire a company, you're paying a premium, and then that's why the shares jump up right after the acquisition is announced. So, they're, this will make them one of the biggest regional banks around. Um, they got a great price, and excuse me, they expect it to be immediately accretive to earnings. So, I kind of like, I really like Synovus. Um, very profitable, well-run bank. Big ambitions. Okay, good. Hey, so uh, Ameris Bank Corp is, is uh, the first one I'm going to talk about here, and uh, listeners have probably heard me talk about it before. Ameris Bank Corp ticker is ABCB. Uh, this is just a, a not so little uh, regional bank in the in the southeast, and the home base is Moultrie, Georgia. And full disclosure, my mom and dad actually live in Moultrie, Georgia. I've played golf with a couple of these guys at Ameris Bank Corps before. I mean, that was not through design. It was just it's small town living there, and so everybody knows everybody. Um, and, and I do own shares of Ameris Bank Corps uh, as well. Uh, but this is a, a company I found back in 2011, really at the depths of the financial crisis, when a lot of these small cap banks, a lot of these tiny banks, particularly in Georgia, for whatever reason, uh, were going belly up. They just they had bad loan books and, and really overextended themselves. And Ameris Bank Corp has just always been a very well run, fairly conservative operation, not trying to uh, you know, write checks that, that the bank can't cash, so to speak. And, and what that resulted in over the course of the few years in that recovery from the, uh, from the financial crisis, the FDIC recognized Ameris Bank Corp's uh, excellence in operating. And and started using Ameris as a partner in rolling up some of these failed financial institutions to give them at least a little bit of an exit strategy, so that everything didn't just go completely uh, to hell in a handbasket, so to speak. And so, what this ultimately did for Ameris, it gave them a very risk-free way to build up uh, their their asset base and their deposit base. I mean, the FDIC basically said, "Hey, any losses are going to be on us. We just want you to help us in getting these things rolled up, and there's going to be nothing really ultimately but upside there for you." And in and, and fast forward to today, that really has uh, worked out for the company. They they now have uh, total assets near close to eleven and a half billion dollars and uh, tangible book. Uh, value per share of close to eighteen dollars, and, and all in all, I think that what you have here in Ameris is a still small cap bank around two billion dollar uh, market cap uh, that has grown its presence beyond just that Georgia footprint. Uh, they have, I think, plenty of opportunities to continue to make some some smart acquisitions going forward, and they certainly have done that. A recent purchase of Atlantic Coast Financial, uh, as well as Hamilton State Bank shares, it's all helping them really grow this this business out. Longtime CEO Edwin Hortman uh, stepped down recently, and the new CEO Dennis Zember, uh, who has been with the company for uh, a number of years, held the position of COO and CFO. So that's all to say, I, I expect that that conservative 
smart, long-term focus mentality uh, to continue here with the Maris Bank Corps. Uh, certainly have developed a, a long track record of success. I suspect we will see that uh, going forward as well. Uh, so that's that's one of those little small cap financials I really like. Uh, speaking of banks, Matt, you wanted to uh, take a trip out west and talk a little bit about Bank of Hawaii, right? Yeah, and well, well since we're talking about some of your disclosures, um, disclosure: I've never been to Hawaii, so I've never been I to have. a Bank of Hawaii branch. <laughs> I was <laughs> looking to Bank see if Hawaii we could get like a full a full branch of Hawaii. That'd be pretty sweet, actually. I could. Uh, if there if there was an office there, I might you know sign up for it. I was pitching that and or the Bahamas. I, I would gladly take either post. <laughs> but, so I've never actually been to a Bank of Hawaii, but I know a lot about them as a bank, and they're definitely they're one of my favorite small cap banks. I've been watching them for a little while. Um, not only are they an extremely profitable bank, but they're along with one other bank, they have a pretty dominant market share in Hawaii. If you're in Hawaii, you generally don't go to like a Bank of America or Wells Fargo. You're either at Bank of Hawaii or First Hawaiian Bank, the other major bank out there. So they have a very big market share, big great reputation on the island. Don't expect too much growth as in geographic growth. They're not, you know, you're not gonna have a Bank of Hawaii branch in Kansas or anything like that. <laughs> but Hawaii's economy is doing great. It's growing at quicker at a faster rate than the rest of the US. So it's one of the fastest growing economies. Again, great reputation. Uh, the loan portfolio, just for example, grew about seven percent over the past year. Most banks were in the three to four percent range when if you look back at our episode where we cover the big banks. So that's just kind of a testament to how strong the Hawaiian economy is right now. Um Consistently profitable throughout any economy. Uh, just kind of a little fun fact: uh, after Citigroup complete, almost collapsed during the financial crisis, they brought in Bank of Hawaii's former CEO to to be the new chairman of the board. So, every, the big guys on Wall Street know how profitable Bank of Hawaii is and how well run it is. Um, so it's definitely it's not a cheap bank stock. I'd put it in kind of the valuation category of a U.S. bank corp, but like just. Just like Sanofi, about about a one point three percent return on assets, an eighteen percent return on equity, which is unheard of for a, a brick and mortar bank. Um, so highly profitable, very very low default rate. I think it was like a point two percent non performing assets rate, which is extremely low. So great economy, great quality bank, great history of just being a well run institution. Um, that's why it's one of my favorites. Hopefully, I get to visit one one day. I feel like, yeah, this is just the opportunity to bring this thing under official coverage here at The Fool, because I have to believe, I mean, the annual meeting is out there in Hawaii, right? I mean, that's got to be where they have the annual meeting. So then you got to go out there, right? I mean, that just it's seems to be the biggest no brainer, right? We'll, we'll look into that uh, later this week, Matt. Uh, let's wrap it up here. And Chris had made specific mention here of a company, Universal Insurance Holdings. I believe this is the company he said this has grown into his biggest position. Uh, and let me tell you, Chris, I think that's not actually such a bad move here. From what I have seen with Universal Insurance Holdings, this is a pretty compelling company here. This is the largest. Private personal residential homeowners insurance company in Florida, uh, and and again, when I say Florida, let's be very clear: most of their business is in Florida. Only twenty six percent of their total insured business is outside of Florida. So this is a Florida play. They they are in sixteen states, but right now this is a Florida play. They are seeking to expand that footprint and and uh, and diversify geographically speaking. But but generally speaking, I mean, we love the insurance business from the investor's perspective because insurance is one of those it's one of those things that's always going to be needed. In particularly, if you're a homeowner, I mean, chances are you've got a mortgage, you got to pay that mortgage, and your mortgage company is going to require it. And even if you've got your mortgage paid off, I mean, nobody nobody owns a home and going to have some type of insurance on it. Uh, so, so it seems like Universal Insurance Holdings has been focusing on its its primary market of Florida, Florida for a number of years. Uh, here, it is a small company, one one and a half billion dollar market cap. But I tell you, if you bought this thing five years ago, you're feeling really good about it. The stock's up close to three hundred percent since then. Um, now, a big measure for us when we look at insurance companies is is through book value, and and we can see through Universal's book value that they are growing. In two thousand and thirteen, that book value was at five dollars and twenty cents per share uh, versus today, which is fifteen dollars and twenty cents per uh, per share. Uh, obviously, that that indicates the company is growing uh, and growing, you know, at a healthy rate. Uh, another metric that we look 
to with insurance companies to understand if they're writing good books of business is the combined ratio. And we like to see that combined ratio under 100%. That tells us that they are writing good business, profitable business. And the combined ratio for Universal in 2017 chalked up at 84.4%. And that actually was a little bit up. Uh, historically, from what we've seen in in, in years past, so I think you know, this is a, it's a well-run business. CEO Sean Downs has been there for a while, has plenty of experience in the industry, and I think the risks with a business like this, particularly in a state like this, is is the natural disasters. Right? I mean, Florida is known for its storms. But I think the flip side of that, and I would push back a little bit on every insurance company in Florida is planning for that stuff. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. So, so I like to believe that management is certainly keeping that uh, on, on their radar as well. And in the way that insurance companies tend to hedge that risk is by reinsurance. Uh, so, so all in all, it does look like uh, Universal Insurance Holdings. It looks like they're doing a lot of good things with the business based on the metrics. The business looks very healthy, strong balance sheet, appears to be very capable management there as well. Uh, Chris, I think you could feel pretty good about owning that one. Uh, so, hey, congratulations on your gains, and, and here's to many, uh, many more dollars in the future.